Okay, I think we'll begin. Are we all set? So Ian has some announcements for us. Um, first and foremost, to those who may be joining us in person for the first time, welcome. Anybody first timer here? Oh, welcome, thank you. And those joining us on Zoom, which way am I supposed to look? This way? <laughs> <laughs> on Zoom, welcome. Next, you may recognize a new face in the HASP office. That is Amy Weber. She's our new office and project manager. She comes to us from the US Department of Commerce, but has resided in Holland for three years. Her and her family are movie buffs. That's why Ian hired her. And they love exploring the myriad of public events hosted in and around Holland. So thank you, Amy, welcome. Lastly, as we approach a new month, we are happy to invite you to our monthly program hosted next Tuesday, October 4th at 9.30 a.m. at the Jack Miller Center for Musical Arts. Oh. The presentation is titled, Saving Journalism and Democracy even as newspapers die. Coffee and cookies will be served beginning at 9 a.m. Sounds like a really good, interesting meeting. So thank you for coming today. William Strohaver, Bill, retired from Jackson Community College after 41 years, where he served as a political science faculty member, dean, and executive vice president. He graduated with a BA in political science from Earlham College, Indiana, and an MA from Ball State University. After reading books by Douglas Tellamy, green interests became central to his retired life, <clears throat> especially after moving to a new home on Skiff Lake in Jackson County with 15 acres of land. There, he has been slowing the rate of habitat loss by removing invasives and planting natives. Bill also has volunteered for numerous environmental organizations, including Legacy Land Trust, where he is a current board member, Dalham Conservancy, Michigan Nature Association, and the Stewardship Network. Please welcome William Strohaver, presenting from Toxic Chemicals, to Trillium, making green end of life decisions. Thank you. <clears throat> Fuels. Oh, and we'll be taking questions at the end. Can you hear me now? <laughs> Louder. Well, I'm glad to be here. This has been a uh, probably about a 10 or 12 year journey for me. Uh, I'm going to convince somebody someday to build one of these conservation burial cemeteries. Um, when I was again looking uh, for end of life options, I read an article in the Audubon magazine, and this was probably in 2010. And they talked about green burial as an option, which I knew nothing about. And I had sort of made the decision that, you know, I certainly am not going to be buried in a cemetery. That's out. And this is something that we keep doing because it's so nice. It moved away from the deer, unfortunately. Do you need that for you? No. No? Yes, I'm teasing. <laughs> okay, there we go. That should do it right there. Is it going to stay there? Yes, it is. Is that better? Okay, good. Sorry about that. Um, and so uh, this article talked about uh, cremation because that was sort of my only option. And uh, as I read through the effects of cremation, I said, you know, I've, I've tried to watch my carbon footprint all through my life. 
And now the last thing that I do is going to harm the earth. So anyway, I decided that I would explore other green options. So this presentation is an attempt to explain why a growing number of Americans would prefer final resting places filled with wildflowers instead of concrete steel. I don't know what to do. I can't. This person fell off uh, Does anybody have any super glue? <laughs> okay, we'll try. We'll try again. I told him that I would have problems with this. I'll cover the pros and cons of conventional burial and cremation, end of life options, the definition and types of green cemeteries and how they're certified, examples of uh, conservation cemeteries, which are the greenest of the green that are located across the United States. And finally, we'll take a deeper look at two conservation cemeteries, Cocosine and Foxfield, which were founded in Ohio consistent with Ohio cemetery law. And those two conservation cemeteries in Ohio are the closest ones to us in Michigan. So anyway, I hope that I don't bury you with too much information. And I uh, certainly hope that I won't burn up your valuable time. But above all, I hope that we have the opportunity to sprout new green information. As I was leaving the house this morning, my wife, as she always does, said, knock them dead. Deborah, <laughs> not appropriate. So this uh, slide presentation takes uh, roughly an hour. And so that we don't spend too much time on a specific topic, uh, please hold your questions to the end. Uh, it'll take a little bit, so we'll have plenty of time for conversation. So if you all have a, little, a pen or something, you can jot down uh, some notes to remember what you wanted to ask. We've heard friends and family casually wish for all of these end of life positive endings. The problem is we're living longer and we're also dying longer. Advanced medicine, nursing homes, hospice, and before we know it, death catches up with us and these end of life hopes were a lifetime memory ago. And so for a number of procrastinating reasons, many of us have not taken the necessary steps to plan. Conversations about death and dying are difficult. We Americans live in a society that seems to deny death and receive care in a medical culture that views death as failure. Conversations about death are difficult because they are multifaceted and complex. Simply bringing up the topic of dying can trigger a range of interpretations and concerns. For example, if you ask your mother what her end of life treatment goals are, she might perceive you as being caring, or she might think you are questioning her capacity to manage your own affairs. Only about a third of Americans have created these planning documents, and only a fifth have discussed their arrangements with their family. What about your plans? Have you prepared these documents? Have you talked to your family about your wishes? I admit lots of thinking, Lots of planning, I know what, I know how, I don't know where yet. Millennials seem to have a more proactive view of end of life decisions. And many young millennial entrepreneurs are forming companies that cater to this need. Look at the ages of these young millennial, millennials and their businesses. For example, how about an app that reminds you five times a day that you're going to die? Will that help you to start planning? Concerned about the environment? Recompose places each body into a stainless steel vessel, along with wood chips, alfalfa, and straw, microbes that naturally occur on the plant material and on and in our bodies power the transformation into soil. So over the next 30 days, everything inside the vessel breaks down thanks to natural decomposition. 
And that process produces about one cubic yard of soil amendment, human composting. And so just last week, uh, California, for example, uh, passed a law permitting human composting and joined Colorado, Oregon, and Vermont. The slide indicates some of the top reasons why millennials are interested in preparing for their death. One of those reasons millennials seem to be prioritizing their estate planning is so that they can distribute their assets and designate appointments, give back to charities they care about, plan for their end of life, and specify their final arrangement wishes, giving rise to the development of numerous apps that help curate, curate their lives. Death apps promise to help a person organize his or her entire online life into a bundle of digital living wills, funeral plans, multimedia, memorial portfolios, digital estate arrangements. In just one or two clicks, all the information is found. It could be the mother of all personal media accounts designated to store all a person's online passwords in one spot for a successor to retrieve after he or she dies. Down at the bottom there, if you've not heard the term death doulas, it's, it's similar to a midwife at the front end of that process. Right? So it's one pers a person that helps in the, in the dying process. Many of these options are linked to cremation and are self-explanatory. Cremains mixed to produce portraits, vinyl records, ornaments, diamonds, or fireworks indicating that millennials like alternative end-of-life events that are not part of the traditional funeral arrangements. Capsula Mundi is a Latin construction that recalls the transformation of our body between th the mineral and vegetal and animal worlds, the three key elements of life on earth. It's an Italian concept that encapsulates the body in an egg-shaped organic container to feed a tree that's planted above it. Well, look it up, look at the pictures. It's kind of interesting. A mushroom suit is a cocoon of mycelium, a living fungus that naturally grows underground amongst the roots and trees and plants and fungi. Not only is mycelium biodegradable, but it also has a few special powers that provides nutrients to the plants growing around it. It can neutralize toxic substances and it can clean up soil by converting waste products into nutrients. Promission is an idea about how to dispose human re remains by way of freeze drying. And many of the others are attempting to make cremation greener and a, an alternative to flame cremation, alkaline hydrolysis, sometimes also referred to as biocremation, resomation, dissolution, aquamation are all types of water cremation instead of uh, using heat. And the base process uh, returns the same result, ashes, but at a fraction of the uh, carbon footprint. Plastination is a process used to preserve body parts. Water and fat are replaced by different colored polymers. Specimens can be touched. They do not smell or do not decay. Where I used to teach uh, the nursing department had a uh, plastinated cadaver that they used in their program. Recompose, uh, we talked about the process of human composting earlier. Many of uh, today's consumers are across generations, but especially in the millennial and Gen Z demographics are focused on making purpose purchases that are purpose-driven, prioritizing eco-friendliness and environmental concerns in addition to cost. So kind of keep those figures in mind as we move through this. These new options that are targeting millennials are breaking with traditional funerals. The older generation, however, still view death as a deeply personal and often unpleasant topic to be avoided. For this generation, the first order of business when making funeral arrangements is choosing a disposition option. And the two most common types are traditional burial and cremation. So let's spend a little bit of time looking at the advantages and disadvantages 
of these traditional methods, focusing on keeping in mind, uh, in particular, environmental impact. So these are all the steps that one needs to take into consideration when using a ground burial and involving vault. What we now call green burials were the default in America prior to the Civil War and the resulting invention and popularization of embalming. Before the mid 1800s, deceased white folks were washed and dressed by the women of the house and laid to rest in shrouds and handmade caskets on family property. Non-landowners were buried on church grounds or in the town commons. Except for the burial itself, the entire process took place within the home and didn't involve morticians or funeral directors occupations that didn't exist at the time. During the Civil War, as soldiers died on battlefields and droves, American burial traditions fundamentally changed. Even if wealthy families could afford shipping their boys home for burial in the family plot, their bodies couldn't last that long train ride without decomposition. Enter experimental embalming procedures. Pioneering physicians would commandeer barns and sheds near the battlefields, sometimes even erecting their own tents to practice embalming techniques on fallen soldiers and would charge families up to $100 per body. It's estimated during the Civil War, out of the 600,000 soldiers who were killed, 40,000 were embalmed. If the Civil War gave doctors the opportunity to tinker with embalming, the assassination of Abraham Lincoln created a market for it. Lincoln's cross-country funeral procession passed through small towns and cities alike en route to his home in Springfield, Illinois. In order to keep his body fresh for the trip, he was embalmed at each stop. When Americans flocked to see his casket, they were shocked to see such face, lifelike facial features on their slain president. So by the mid-19th century, the newly emerged profession of businessmen undertakers who provided funeral and burial services began adopting embalming methods as standard practice. Each step on the slide entails an additional set of choices that you personally need to make, depending on your preferences, depending on your budget. And as we shall see, traditional burial because of these steps and family preferences is the most expensive type of body disposition. As you can see from the slide, traditional burials are obviously not a green option. The toxicity of embalming fluids, the huge waste in resources, the fossil fuels used in manufacturing, concrete and steel, and the transportation of these funeral products across the United States. In a February article in the New York Times about green burial, it summarized this, this concern. Quote, a 10 acre cemetery can, can contain as much as 20,000 tons of concrete from vaults and enough embalming fluid to fill a swimming pool, turning the land into a landfill underground. Also notice, if I turn the slide, that worker safety is also a concern. So look at the uh, rates of embalmers or, or people that are dealing with the embalming fluids, higher death rates in for embalmers, higher risk of leukemia, et cetera. So worker safety is at risk in cemeteries, factories, and embalming facilities, as well as funeral homes. So looking at uh, the pros and cons, burial is generally preferred by the Christian, Jewish, and Muslim faiths. It's the oldest form of body disposition in the United States. Burial is often considered to be more natural with the grave site closure, especially among the older generations. And of course, the body can be moved if needed. Thank you. My wife is usually in a room saying, so I, so I appreciate that, girl. I'll, let, I'll pause and let you digest. On the other side, uh, there's a fear from 
some based on horror stories, particularly if you've read Edgar Allan Poe, where people are buried alive. Burial is generally much more expensive than cremation. Cemetery rules may prohibit some of your funeral plans. The US is running out of burial space, especially in large urban areas. And we are, of course, talked about the toxic chemicals associated with embalming, the waste of scarce resources, and the release of carbon dioxide. So, of course, uh, as more and more people begin to think about the environment, the funeral industry is also thinking about how they might become greener. And certainly funeral homes are doing the same thing. So these new offerings will hopefully result in less negative impact on the environment as well as a reduced cost for grieving families. And also, as we'll see a little bit later on, we'll talk about the notion of hybrid cemeteries. Hybrid cemeteries are ones in which there's a, a traditional cemetery that opens up space or inter intermingles green burials with, with the more traditional uh, uh, ground burials. So all of those uh, are, are certainly uh, hoping to uh, improve the environmental consequences of, of this particular method. The average cost of a funeral in the United States is $8,000 plus the average cost of a burial plot in the US is a little over a thousand. And so you break down of the, a breakdown of the fees, 2,500 basic fees for service, 2,500 for casket, 1,500 funeral home fees, 925 funeral ceremony, 700 embalming and body preparation, 500 transportation, then also purchase of a headstone, 1,500. So as we'll see, the green burial costs are essentially the plot cost. There's no casket, there's no vault, there's no embalming. So again, all these prices uh, are dependent on the consumer preference and certainly also uh, uh, dependent on geographic area of the country. The national median cost of a funeral with a viewing and burial in 2021 was approximately 7,848. Well, the median cost of funeral with cremation was approximately 6,971. The average cost of a funeral in Michigan was uh, 7,000 um, end of life expense. And then, you know, what's one, one and I, I guess I never thought about it, many of you probably have, um, it's the cost of the funeral, but also you've got to add in all of the cost of uh, end of life expenses, medical bills, for example. So if you begin to add all of those together, the average in Michigan is about uh, $19,000, 19006 Cremation is a, a method of body disposition that serves as an alternate to traditional burial in a coffin or casket. And cremation is slowly becoming the preferred method of body disposition, particularly by the baby boomer generation due to the cost convenience and especially in the era of COVID. So that industrial furnace, the proper name for that is called a retort. The retort uh, is the actual chamber where the uh, cremation takes place. These are the projections of the growth of cremation in the United States by the Cremation Association of North America. Again, fueled principally by the baby boomer generation. So I would expect that those numbers in the out year might be even higher due to the impact of over a million deaths attributed to, uh, to, to COVID and families becoming more familiar with the cremation process, moving away from more traditional funerals. And again, uh, hopefully green burial options will cut into these projections uh, if you look out there to 2030, to almost 72% of people will be decided on cremation. Cremation is often touted as a greener alternative to ground burial and embalming. However, is it really a green alternative? <laughs> so that figure at the top was the one that um, caught my attention. Um, Again, um, as you think about trying to uh, do all that you can to preserve the environment, your last act 
on this planet shouldn't be harming it. This uh, slide was created by the uh, Conservation Barrier Alliance, which we'll talk about a little bit later. It's uh, designed to educate people regarding the uh, climate change impact of uh, cremation. Um, so I'll just pick out some of the items that might be, I don't know, I guess that's not too bad. You can read that, right? Anybody? Hopefully. Cremated remains, one of the things that people are looking at now, well, gee, there's all these things, opportunities now that I can take my cremation and I can dig some surface soil up and put cremains in there and I can help the, the wild, I help nature and help the trees grow and help plants grow. Now, if, if you look at this slide, it says cremained, cremated remains are too sweet for soil to eat with an alkaline pH of 11.8. And cremated remains are, una are una unable to release their nutrients. And cremated remains are too salty for the roots and leaves of plants to use. The sodium content of cremated remains can be 200 to 2,000 times higher for tree and plant roots and leaves to thrive. They obviously uh, contribute to greenhouse gas emissions, 255 pounds of carbon per cremation, the release of 139 pounds of CO2 per cremation, and if look, look at those annual numbers, release of 1.74 billion pounds of CO2 emissions in the United States annually. Think what I, think that what that amount might be in 2030 when 70% of the population might be choosing cremation. So I'm looking at the, uh, I did this one right. Looking at the uh, pros and cons of uh, cremation, um, it's generally preferred by Hindus and Buddhists. Um, you, you've all seen the piers floating down the Ganges or uh, the funeral piers on, 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 on the shore. Um, it's certainly, it's touted as an, en an environmentally friendly uh, mode as opposed to uh, uh, use the use of uh, embalming and crypts. Um, obviously, I think we can not put that on the pro side. Probably the major uh, uh, factor that people like is its flexibility. Um, and, and by flexibility, you, you have an opportunity to review all the places that your loved one loved, and you can take pieces and parts of the of the of the remains and distribute them in various locations. And also, you can distribute the remains uh, among family members. Uh, as an example. The cons, um, many people would argue that there's no closure because there's, you know, especially if you have a direct cremation, which we'll talk about in a minute, uh, where the body goes directly to the crematorium and then um, you get the, the remains re in return or, or, or they're buried, which is a preference of about 20% or more of the people that have uh, op chosen the option. Um, some people have difficulty thinking about their loved one placed in a retort at 1900 degrees. Religious or cultural objections, um, extensive use of fossil fuels, we mentioned release of carbon dioxide and it's permanent. Michigan, uh, currently there are no state laws controlling where you may keep or scatter ashes. Ashes can be stored in a crypt, uh, a niche, a grave, or a container at home. Michigan does not does allow scattering ashes on the water. Federal law, interestingly enough, uh, states that spreading ashes on the sea is considered a burial at sea, and so you're first required to report the burial at sea to the Environmental Protection Agency, and you must be at least three miles away from the shore before scattering the ashes. As was the case for uh, ground burial, uh, also the folks involved in the funeral industry are trying to provide cremation services that seek to address the environmental issues. Alkaline hydrolysis, which we talked about uh, earlier, is a chemical process that uses a solution of 95% water and 5% potassium hydroxide or sodium hydroxide to reduce the body to components of liquid and bone. 
And then bone fragments are retained so they can be dried and turned into a substance which is similar to cremated ashes. Alkaline uh, hydrolysis is currently legal in 20 states. However, this number is in constant flux as statutes change and are even in some cases being repealed. Uh, it is legal in the state of Michigan. And by, by the way, uh, the medical schools, you know, the, I, I hope I don't offend anyone by, with this comment, but I mean, sometimes when you donate your body and there are no usable parts, I'm sorry, uh, this is a process that uh, those medical schools use. Uh, and so they've been using it for, for years. Uh, Bio-urn uh, sounds like an interesting idea. Uh, remember that the final product of cremation is calcium phosphate and sodium. So um, I'd be a little bit concerned about that one as to, it might sound like it's environmentally friendly, but the plant's probably going to die unless you don't do some serious amending of the soil. Sea burial, uh, the cremains of an individual are incorporated into an environmentally safe concrete mixture designed to create artificial reef formations. These uh, cement fears are then placed in one of the permitted ocean locations selected by the individual, the family, uh, or, or a friend. And these cement reefs make, made of environmentally safe cast concrete are placed on the ocean floor as a permanent memorial. So there are two types of uh, cremation, a full service cremation and a direct cremation. A full service cremation provides a funeral service and also includes placement of the urn in a mausoleum, a columbarium, or a burial plot. Direct burial or cremation is when the deceased is taken straight to the crematorium or cemetery without a funeral ceremony. So the difference in cost between a cremation and a burial can be substantial depending on where you live, the funeral home you use, and the services that you request. So for instance, while a direct cremation can cost as little as $800 in some states, a cremation with a full funeral can cost almost $10,000. In Michigan, the average cost of a direct cremation is $795 and the cost of a full service cremation is about 5,065. Popular culture tends to reinforce the idea that Embalming is a necessary step, even in cremation. About 48% of people are only about 48% of people are aware that embalming isn't needed for a cremation service. And that's according to the uh, National Funeral Directors Association. So, why are people choosing green? We spent some time looking at uh, the two methods of body disposition that are commonly used in the United States, each with some significant environmental concerns. And so the rest of our time today, we're going to spend looking at green options. And first, uh, why are people looking for greener options? The top five are listed on the slide, but perhaps the most important reason people choose green burial is right in the name. It's environmentally friendly. Green burials do away with both the embalming chemicals and the extraneous cement, steel, or other non-biodegradable materials conventional berries put into the earth and lack the carbon footprint of cremation, which has been calculated, by the way, to guzzle as much energy in the form of natural gas or electricity as a 500-mile car trip. Perhaps the uh, most personal reason of all is one where the idea of green burial simply speaks to a person. They might find it comfortable and take comfort in the notion that their body is returning to nature. Or they wanna take part in a conservation burial where burial fees are also used to cover land protection, restoration, and management. We'll talk more about conservation burial in a, in a few moments. A 2020 survey from the Funeral Directors Association found that nearly 62% of Americans expressed interest in green burial options. Most cited environmental reasons, but others mentioned costs. 
Green burial is the long ago practice of laying loved ones to rest in biodegradable wooden caskets or shrouds without embalming or gaining in popularity. The movement is made up of a diverse coalition, environmentalists, historic preservationists, and folks looking to cut the costs and are looking for options that are not offered within the traditional funeral industry. The American Way of Death is an expose of abuses in the funeral home industry in the United States that was written by Jessica Mitford and published in 1963. For a family in Mitford's home, or in fine, let me start over. For a family in Mitford's time, a family was likely, a funeral was likely to be the third long, largest expense in their lifetime, followed only by a house and a car. This had been made possible, Mitford concluded, because funeral directors have perpetuated, quote, a huge, macabre, and expensive practical joke on the American public, unquote. According to Mitford, funeral directors claimed that a bombing, crypts, and caskets were required by law and then took financial advantage of families in their time of need. Her best selling book led to legislation to protect grieving families from the unscrupulous practices of this dismal trade. In, in 1996, Mitford thoroughly revised and updated her classic study confronting new trends, including the success of the professional lobbyists. That's kind of funny, right? The person that most is supposed about turning phones off. God, have I? In uh, 2002, Juliet and Joe Sheehy, Joe Sheehy, by the way, and is, is from Michigan, and his parents are, are still living in Michigan, moved to the Mojave Desert with a vision of opening an Inco retreat influenced by early Christian monastics who made pilgrimage to the desert in order to befriend death. They hoped to invite others to find solace in the fierce landscape that is Joshua Tree, California. Together, they developed the first set of standards decide to tr try to make cemeteries greener and try to make the funeral professionals and the product manufacturers that support them green as well. And they launched the Green Burial Council in 2005. The Green Burial Council gained significant traction as a result of a book authored by Mark Harris, which I believe is on your bibliography here, who was a former environmental columnist with the Los Angeles Times and was the author of the signature book on green burial, Grave Matters, a journey through the modern funeral industry in a natural, to a natural way of burial, which was published in 2007. The book followed a dozen families who conduct natural burials for their dead, include, including burials in backyard grave sites and natural cemeteries, as well as sea burials, and funerals at home, among other strategies. The book showed how educated consumers are taking back control of the funeral experience, saving thousands of dollars with options that are more personal, meaningful, and environmentally friendly. The Families in Grave Matters reminded readers what funerals are really for. No amount of money, no conspicuous funerary consumption can buy the satisfaction of honoring our dead in a truly personal way. Today, the Green Burial Council has grown to become the standard barrier and the lead steward of the growing environmental, social, consumer green burial movement to ensure that our end of life practices and the facilities, the products and the practices associated with them further legitimatize environmental aims. Standards are the way that the Green Burial Council can support ways of caring for the dead and in do doing so make end of life rituals more meaningful, simple, and sustainable. GBC uh, Green Burial Council certification allows consumers to be able to distinguish between three different types of green cemeteries and understand that each has a different set of standards. 
it requires cemetery operators to commit to a certain degree of transparency, accountability, and third party oversight. And it prevents future owners from going back on whatever ecological or aesthetic promises have been made in the past. From limitations to burial density that protect a local ecosystem to prohibitions against the use of monuments that would negatively impact views. So what is a green burial? In a typical green burial, the body is not cremated. It's not prepared with the chemicals. It's not buried in a concrete vault. It's simply placed in a biodegradable container and interred in a grave site to decompose fully and return to nature. Environmentally friendly green burials are becoming more common. Most states don't require people to use the services of, of a funeral home. Michigan, by the way, is one of the few states that does. And we'll talk about that in a, in a while. Not a bad idea, actually. Uh, so in Michigan, a, a funeral director or, or a doctor or a medical examiner must certify a uh, death cert cert certificate. While the practice is legal in Michigan, most local cemeteries have regulations that uh, prohibit the method. Can you bury a body at home? Michigan law permits the establishment of private burial grounds of less than one acre in size outside of city or village limits. However, you have to check obviously with local zoning laws before establishing a home cemetery or burying on private land. The property then is surveyed and recorded in the county registers office and land will then be exempt from uh, taxation. There are three types of uh, green burial cemeteries. They're certified by the Green Burial Council, hybrid, natural, and conservation. And so we'll look at each one of these uh, uh, three. And the standards, uh, by the way, by the Green Burial Council are cumulative, meaning the starting standards for the hybrid cemetery and the natural burial standards then are built on that plus additional standards. And finally, the conservation burial encompasses all of the standards for hybrid as well as natural with some additional requirements for conservation burial. The hybrid cemetery is a conventional cemetery, and it's a cemetery in which uh, it provides the opportunity to bury, as we discussed, the traditional method of uh, embalming with crypts, but also allows uh, green burials. It also allows individuals to be buried without a, uh, a, a, a casket, without a, a vault, and without uh, being embalmed. So they offer both uh, conventional and green burials, uh, and so again, in terms of cost, uh, you can see if, if, if you pick a traditional cemetery and you opt for a green burial, the cost is significantly lowered, plus you're protecting the environment. So again, uh, if we're concerned about the environment, uh, even though we're not doing a whole lot other than the individuals, that are being placed there and uh, using green techniques. We're not significantly doing anything about uh, protection of habitat, water quality, uh, and the use of scarce resources. So these hybrid cemeteries are developed consistent with uh, state law. The main element of the first type of green cemetery is an earned level of CBC certification in truth and marketing, uh, family opportunity to participate in the burial. The seedants must not be embalmed, or if they are embalmed, uh, use non-toxic embalming chemicals, and there can be no use of a vault or liners. So there, there are numerous cemeteries in Michigan that advertise as being green or natural but there are only two certified hybrid cemeteries in Michigan. Um, so the two are on the slide, Linden Meadows and the Meadows at Ridgeway. And so just as funeral homes and crematoriums are attempting to address environmental concerns, cemetery operators are also providing a greener, less costly option by designated either existing space or in established cemeteries for green burials or, or expanding their cemetery to include uh, 
a, a green burial uh, addition. So the, the picture on the slide, uh, by the way, is a view of the uh, meadows at Ridgeway. The second type of uh, green burial cemetery certified by the Green Burial Council is a natural burial ground cemetery. Notice at first that it conforms to all of the It conforms to all the elements of a green burial that we talked about earlier. I'm sitting here with my finger on the button. I'll figure that one out. Push. And by the way, I have a, a note down here at the bottom. You see that with the color on it? It says advance. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I know. Oh, mark that one down. Notice that, as I said, that it conforms to all the elements of a green barrel. Uh, in addition, however, we are moving to a cemetery where only green burials are permitted. And we're also moving to a more ecologically sound process for the establishment of the cemetery. So typically, if we start looking at the uh, elements of the standards, there is an ecological, ecological survey done. Uh, so it, it, it's concerned about protecting existing uh, native uh, plants that might be endangered. It's concerned with making sure that we don't uh, put uh, grave sites in uh, uh, areas where they won't decompose appropriately. So you avoid wetlands, for example. Uh, so it, it's, it's about trying to not only um, protect from all of the problems of the other two that we mentioned, but also begin to move toward uh, all of these other environmentally uh, sensitive issues that we wanna to try to deal with. Advance. So some, as I said, some of the important uh, new standards uh, conduct uh, an ecological impact assessment uh, no burials in sensitive areas, uh, no long-term degradation of the property, limit the type and size of memorial markers, and limit burial density to 400 burials per acre. Anybody know what uh, a traditional cemetery allows, what the, what the average is in the United States? 1,000 to 1,200 per acre. And I was just reading an article uh, about uh, a, Bronx, a Bronx cemetery in New York City. Um, they have an increased demand. And so they're, they're trying to expand into areas that haven't been opened yet. And so the projection is that for new internments, it will be approximately 2,500 per acre. And that would be a combination of uh, uh, people that go through funerals or, or people that want to bury uh, uh, cremains at the funeral. Think about that impact. So we have two uh, certified natural burial grounds in the state of Michigan. Um, again, there, there are cemeteries that claim they're, they're natural and, and they might very well be. Uh, but they simply have not been certified by the Green Burial Council. Um, so the two uh, on the slide, Hebrew Memorial and the Preserve It All Saints. And this is a, a picture on the slide uh, uh, that uh, was taken at the Preserve It All Saints in uh, Waterford. The Conservation Burial Alliance is an alliance of the founders of eight different certified conservation burial preserves in the United States that have partnered with uh, conservation land trusts to make natural burial possible on permanent protected land. This partnership developed additional standards that must be followed to be certified as a conservation burial preserve by the Green Burial, uh, uh, Green burial Council. Again, uh, all of the same. You, you know the drill for hybrid and natural or here plus additional ones. 
So a conservation burial cemetery is a place where you can choose to have a natural burial. Uh, your family members and friends can participate in the sacred act of burial. A natural landscape and native wildlife are protected. Anyone and everyone can experience rest and reflection and regeneration. And perhaps most importantly, the land is permanently protected by a conservation easement, means that it will be protected and monitored in perpetuity. So none of the stuff where uh, cemeteries close down and then fall in disrepair and then eminent domain comes in and says, we wanna build new apartment buildings. Moving on. I'm trying not to do it again twice, right? I can't do I can't do it three times. Conservation burial is what it sounds like. It's natural burial on land is protected by a recognized conservation land trust, where conservation principles are employed to support sustainable cemetery management practices while restoring and protecting the ecological integrity of the land that is being protected in perpetuity. By the way, am I overselling this option with my wallpaper here? I remember toxic chemicals to trillion. I was listening to, uh, never mind. Did anybody catch David Letterman last night? I, I can't sleep before I do something like this. Any, anyway, he was talking about the fact that if you have to explain a joke to the audience, it's not funny. <laughs> I'm thinking, well, okay, I get it. The uh, standards of a conservation burial preserve include all the previous standards. Conservation burial preserve must be at least 20 acres where the conservation value is protected or restored. So there's a restoration process that goes along with this. The preservation partners with a conservation organi organization that guarantees the protection of the burial ground by a conservation easement that is enforced in perpetuity and also has the responsibility for monitoring and enforcement. And the average burial density uh, cannot exceed 300 burials per acre. So if you're thinking about uh, protecting your loved one, um, the right of sepulcher and with a conservation easement that probably protects property in a manner which eminent domain can't touch. And by the way, I'm not an attorney. Right of sepulcher, an easy way of looking at it is that once a person is interred, that person has a right to stay there. And, you know, obviously that's been uh, disputed throughout the years. That, that comes from common law, by the way. This is um, probably hard for some of you. To, oh, if I I'll advance it. Um, so let, let, let me kind of point out some things that I think you should look at. Uh, it, healthy ecosystems, that, that's, uh, uh, you know, and, Conservation burial promotes uh, attempting to restore and manage, uh, manage uh, of the property. Um, it's, it's a way of bringing the community together. Because um, you know, if you look at typical nature preserves, uh, you can hike there, you can bird watch there, you can have weddings there, you can have uh, events, uh, uh, the family and friends or organizations. And what we're saying is that with a with a conservation burial grounds, all those same kinds of things can can go on in the property as well. So the land is uh, protection. We've talked about that, and and climate resiliency, uh, the use of biodegradable materials, eliminate toxic processes and sequester carbon. Again, busy. I don't know why I've got all these in here, but. I, li I like this notion of the, you know, the recycling kind of thing. Uh, as, as, and it's what, what we're really saying is the crux of the whole process. So you're returning, so at the bottom of the page there, if you're returning the elements in your body are returned to the earth by burying naturally, they're then released and the body releases these to beneficial nutrients to trees and, and plants. 
and the restored nutrients then help to uh, restore and replenish the soil. And then, as we said, a, a percentage of the uh, cost of the internment right is used for the uh, management of the of the site of the cemetery. So both of these were uh, promotional materials created by the uh, Conservation Burial Alliance. So uh, sort of just uh, summarizing here, um, no toxic embalmment, no, no vaults. I'm not gonna read this to you. No herbicides, pesticides, we really didn't talk about that, or fertilizers, sustainable management practice, GPS. We'll talk about that in a minute. But one, of, one of the concerns about conservation burials is, that, well, I'm not gonna be able to find my loved one. And, and we'll, we'll address that in, in a moment. But you can rest in peace. <laughs> These are um, the, the certified conservation burial grounds in the United States. Um, so these are the eight conservation burial cemeteries that are charter members of the uh, Conservation Burial Alliance. Today, today there are 10 conservation burial grounds that are members of the Conservation Burial Alliance. Baldwin Hill Conservation Cemetery in Fayette, Maine, opened its doors in July of 2021, and Blue Stem Conservation Preserve in Cedar Grove, North Carolina, opened uh, its doors um, last week, September 2022. These uh, conservation cemeteries are located across the United States from Florida to the state of Washington. The overarching aim and goal of this organization is to preserve over 100 million acres of ground. Focusing uh, Nature Preserve Cemetery and Foxfield Nature Preserve are located in central Ohio and are closest to uh, the state of Michigan. And so the rest of the presentation, I want to take a little bit deeper dive, look at Cocosing and Foxfield to get a feel for what a conservation burial preserve looks like, how they're managed, and the processes, how some of the processes are different. Kenyon College is a private liberal arts college located in Gambier, Ohio. It was founded in 1824 by Philander Chase and is the oldest private college in Ohio with around 1,600 students. Does that sort of sound familiar here? Sort of the same kind of tradition, huh? The campus is noted for its strong liberal arts curriculum, its Gothic architecture, uh, think Hogwarts, right? And its rural setting. The building shown above is Old Kenyon, which was built in 1829, is considered the earliest example of collegiate Gothic architecture in the United States. The college, formed the Philander Chase Conservancy in 2000 in anticipation of a greater need to protect the farmland and rural nature of the surrounding area. The mission of the Philander Chase Conservancy is to protect the natural beauty of the farms, the woodlands and the waters and the open spaces surrounding Kenyon College and to preserve the rural char character of the region at large. Anybody know what's going on close to Kenyon now? The Intel plant that's going to produce no computer chips is located about 30 miles from Kenyon. This was pretty important for them to make these kinds of decisions back in 2000, wasn't it? The uh, Philander Chase Conservancy was instrumental in the creation of uh, Cocosing Nature Preserve. The preserve offers a natural burial option on 23 acres of native prairie and woodlands. Kenyon, like many colleges, has had a cemetery on campus almost since its founding day, but the preserve project puts Kenyon's cemetery business on the cutting edge of the growing trend toward a simpler method of burial that are environmentally friendly. Cocosing is a certified conservation burial ground. The slide shows the entrance at Cocosing and a picture of Amy Hendrickson, who is the uh, project coordinator, manager, and preserve steward. I uh, interviewed Amy a couple of summers ago to try to understand the process of creating cocosing as we walked the property. I, th I thought as I got into this that, my gosh, all liberal, small liberal arts colleges all throughout the Midwest 
probably started with what, their own cemetery. They're all looking for new funding sources. It's cons never mind. It's I mean it's it's becomes a no brainer for colleges too. I think. Amy has uh, been with the project since developing the proposal that was submitted to the Philander Chase um, Board and the Kenyon Co College Board that authorized the uh, creation of Cocosine and has been involved in the different stages of restoration and uh, uh, maintenance of, of, the, of the cemetery itself. She's sort of like a one-man show, and that's the problem with conservation cemeteries as well. The upfront money is not put into adequate marketing and ad adequate staffing, and so She's the only person that runs this uh, this preserved cemetery, pretty much. You know, certainly the college provides some of the routine kind of um, grounds, uh, maintenance and so forth. Interesting here, here we, we, we realize that my hometown is in Pickle, Ohio, and Amy's parents were from Pickle, Ohio. And even more, incidentally, my family were members of the Westminster Presbyterian Church, and so were her family members. So we talked a lot about Piqua as well as the, <laughs> as well as the cemetery. This is the, uh, the entrance to, to Cocosing. Um, as we walk the grounds, Amy mentioned that she would have liked to have had more of a say in the entrance design, uh, perhaps a more natural look as opposed to the formal look that colleges seem to like, right? Got to have their clock towers and pillars. Right? In 2013, the Flander Chase Conservancy purchased the 18-hole public tomahawk golf course on Quarry Chapel Road in Gambier in order to protect the area as green space for the local community and also to create a conservation burial ground that provided an option for green burial to central Ohio. So they started out with uh, approximately 45 acres. Half of that was put into uh, grasslands, uh, grasses, and, and also uh, uh, wildflowers. And then uh, 20 uh, of the acres was plotted and uh, they put in uh, 2,300 burial plots. Uh, and the remaining uh, acres then are sort of a standby in case the uh, uh, cemetery needs to expand. The uh, picture on the left um, identifies the early stages of the restoration process on the right a more mature view of the same scene. And remember that uh, restoration of the land is one of the standards for a conservation burial ground and part of the management plan. So these are uh, various pictures of uh, restoration and management of the Cocosine Preserve. There's little mowing, no weed whips, no pesticides, no herbicides. Can you tell that it's a cemetery? Oh, not you can read it. As I was uh, researching Cocosine, I came across this letter sent to the Conservancy thanking them for creating Cocosine. The letter was written by a retired faculty member of Kenyon College. That's how it gets to you, another one. One of the concerns expressed that we talked about a few moments ago of people thinking about conservation burial grounds is whether, this, whether the site of a family member or a loved one will be lost to uh, future generations. The picture on the left is an example of a natural stone headstone. It's flat to the ground with limited markings. And then additionally, on the right, all sites are marked with a GPS locator, and the GPS coordinates are recorded in the cemetery office. So grave site locations will not be lost to family, uh, future family members, next generation. What's the reason for the difference in price for uh, prairie and woodland? You ever tried to dig a hole around trees? It's more labor intense. <laughs> so obviously these, uh, when we talk about conservation burial uh, cemeteries, 
prices don't include the cost of transportation. That's taken care of by the family. Uh, and it doesn't include the cost of uh, the funeral home fees. So those, those are all separate. This is simply the, the internment right. And then there are some additional costs associated with that. So no, I won't do that. Airlines are in the news right now. Right? Um, so, so for example, to uh, uh, intern a person in terms of digging the, the grave and also the closing of the grave, some differences in terms of whether it's on the weekend or whether it's on a, uh, on a holiday or during the week, those kinds of things. Caucusing is kind of interesting. So, so $2,500 and, and remember that, uh, well, I didn't tell you this, but caucusing is a 501c, excuse me. Flander Chase Conservancy is a 501c3 nonprofit, right? Nonprofit cemeteries are 501c13s. So Flander Chase can't use the properties from a nonprofit cemetery because the nonprofit cemetery, according to IRS rules, can only use the proceeds on the maintenance and management and per, per, per creating an endowment for perpetual care, okay? So caucusing sort of has figured out a way to get around it. What, what they say to you is, okay, you contribute $2,500 to the Philander Chase Foundation. And in return, Philander Chase Foundation will permit you one to purchase one internment right for $2,500. And the, the interesting part of this, and I've not seen this anyplace else, is that they say you have three years to do that. So, you know, you can't, what they're saying is we don't want you buying an internment right and then you die and nobody remembers that anybody has done that and it languishes there uh, forever. Um, so uh, the total cost then would be $5,000 plus these additional costs, plus the uh, funeral costs if you choose to have a funeral uh, home involved. So the, the purchase of the internment right is not tax deductible, but the contribution to the Philander Chase Conservancy is tax deductible, deductible. This is a picture of the Wilderness Center. The Wilderness Center is a um, nature center and also a, uh, that's why I said, I don't know, move that way. Did I, did I skip two? It's not advancing. This is not on me. <laughs> I'm asking if there are batteries in here. Oh, sure. I'll, I'll figure this one out by the end of the program. Okay, I'm just practicing. I don't want to go here. I want to go back. <laughs> Well, no, it's, I, I need to go back one. That's what I did. They're kidding. Don't ask me any questions about previous slides. <laughs> We're moving forward. We're not going back. Foxfield Preserve uh, was opened in 2008 uh, by the Wilderness Center. Uh, as I said, the Wilderness Center is um, a, a 501c3. It's a non nonprofit nature center and also a land conservancy. That's kind of unique, by the way. Um, Wilderness Center is located near uh, Wilmot, uh, Ohio. It's the uh, first natural burial ground in Ohio. And it was the first in the country, and I think probably still is, that's operated, no, it's not, 
first to be operated by a conservation organization. So this, this organization and its a director way back in 2010, Gordon Malpin, is sort of the creator of the notion of ecopreneurialism. And so he was very much concerned that nonprofits are locked in sort of a traditional mode and they need to get out of that mode if they're going to be successful and sustainable moving in. And so getting into conservation burial was one of the things that he figured out that he could do to, to make Foxfield uh, sustainable going into the future or, or the Wilmington Center. Uh, this is the entrance to uh, Foxfield. That looks like a traditional cemetery, doesn't it? And this is a picture of uh, Hannah Mann. She is the uh, uh, new uh, executive director of, of Foxfield that just uh, took over the position in 2022. She's a graduate of Hiram College and received her bachelor's degree. In, listen, this is kind of interesting to me in biomedical humanities and also graduated from Northeast Ohio Medical University. Um, uh, so, so, I mean, um, think about the kind of background that she would have in terms of talking to people that are grieving and what kind of pro process should I go through and what should I do and so on and so forth. So this is uh, sort of a welcome uh, and uh, to uh, Foxfield Nature Preserve. It uh, looks like many of the trails that you've probably walked in many other nature preserves. The preserve trails here at Ho uh, Hope College or trails at DeGroff for outdoor discovery. I found this letter sent to Foxfield by a hiker who uh, frequents the preserve. Quote, I love the quiet. I love that it's a wildlife refuge. And I love that no one for any generation will be surrounded by concrete or fake flowers. So remember that uh, Foxfield is first a nature preserve. And that's true obviously of all of the other nature preserves that uh, were on that list that we talked about earlier. Most of the uh, properties planted with native prairie grasses and wildflowers will not be mowed in the uh, same manner as a conventional cemetery. Mode paths provide access to all areas of the nature preserve. If needed for a burial, a temporary path will be mowed to provide direct access to the burial plot. Restoration techniques to improve the health of the prairie obviously also would include periodic prairie burnings. And then remember also that there's a permanent endowment that uh, provides the funds that uh, maintain the management and maintenance of the, uh, of the preserve. Foxfield uh, Preserve was farmland a decade ago, a decade ago, but since the 40 acre site, 43 acre site acquired by TM TWC, it's been undergoing uh, ecological restoration, uh, conver conserf conservation, boy, oh boy. How much longer have I got on that? Conservation professionals are working to restore <clears throat> 15 acres of native prairie grasses and wildflowers. In 25 years, there will be a young forest with plenty of small trees and herbaceous ground cover. In 80 years, there will be a mature forest. And in 200 years, there will be a truly unique and diverse area with rolling meadows and towering trees. This uh, description of Foxfield reminds me of one of my favorite proverbs. Quote, a society grows great when old men plant trees whose shade they know they shall never sit in. And again, this is simply to point out that uh, it is a, 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 first of all, a nature preserve. And so, you know, if you, if you they serve, the Conservation of the Area Alliance surveyed people that use these uh, preserves across the country, and these are the kinds of things that they said that, that they do. Um, conservation burial, I, I love this quote, can be considered as chaining yourself to a tree post-mortem. Not allowing development on the land where your corpse rests 
In addition, land can be restored with any plants and the community is built around the cemetery and the land can be enjoyed as any other nature preserve. These are some of the promotional materials from uh, Foxfield. I particularly like the one on the left. <clears throat> Cost at Foxfield, um, internment rights APD. APD stands for Advanced Planning Discount. So uh, if you plan ahead, they'll even let you uh, do a payment plan, for example. Uh, and then uh, if if at the last minute you need to buy, to purchase an internment right, it's four thousand dollars. And again, uh, this does not include uh, additional cost of the uh, cemetery itself, and it doesn't include it doesn't include uh, funeral home expenses. And, and one of the things I want, I want to point out, funeral homes are well positioned to serve the needs of families who choose green burial options. Uh, they have established expertise in family counseling, uh, funeral and internment planning, uh, publishing obituaries, transportation of the deceased and regulatory compliance. And so most conservative uh, land conservatives do not have this expertise. And so conservation burial cemeteries have developed partnerships with area funeral homes. Working with a funeral home is probably the most reliable way to ensure successful, a successful burial. And so you have an option of working with a certified Green Burial Council funeral home, or you can take Foxfield rules, for example, to that funeral home. And if the funeral home agrees and follows them, fine. If the funeral home says no, then you need to find another funeral home if you want your loved one to be buried at Foxfield. So what I th thought I'd do for the last uh, few slides is to uh, look at, uh, what did I do now? You did that. <laughs> we, we enabled the feature and it just, if you could just click that. It was... well, let, oh, let, okay. me, let me use your finger. No, oh, okay. <laughs> I'm just going to do this so that everybody can see your wonderful slide. There we go. <laughs> well, so so the, these are, uh, I'm just going to give you a, sort of a collage of uh, pictures from various conservation cemeteries and, and the steps from beginning to end. Um, so some of these are from Cocosing and uh, Foxfield and others are from the other cemeteries that were on the slides uh, previously. So this is uh, one of the processions of taking a loved one to the burial site. Looks like a traditional procession, doesn't it? You know, where you have the black Cadillacs lined up, blocking traffic from, never mind. Minimally, it's not a, it's not a typical funeral procession, right? Most uh, conservation burial cemeteries do not allow mechanical digging of graves. They do provide the service of digging the grave, but also in some cases allow friends and families to participate in the digging of the grave. It's uh, extremely hard work and not encouraged. So all conservation burial cemeteries allow the participants to uh, close the grave site with a uh, cemetery steward present. So family and friends are uh, fully involved in the uh, process. Typically, graves are dug at 3.5 feet and then mounded with an additional two or three feet of soil. And in six months, virtually no trace of the disturbed ground remains. The six feet uh, deep dimension is largely a, a myth of modern cinema, but does have some historic origins. In 1665, during the plague of London, the Lord Mayor stipulated that all graves should be six feet deep. And then this was followed in the United States and then mostly discarded. Some also argue that the six feet was stipulated to prevent farmers from plowing up grave sites. Remember, a lot of burials occurred on family farms, right? These are examples of different types of biodegradable caskets. Again, notice the differences, um, biodegradable materials, instead of scarce resources. 
a lot of the wood comes from the Amazon rainforest for, for casket material, for example. Considerably lower costs, environmentally friendly as the materials will naturally decompose. These are uh, examples of different types of uh, biodegradable shrouds. And then it also sort of addresses the question of how, how you get to a body to a grave site. And so you can see the different types of vehicles or transportation that's, that's used. So the body is not embalmed, so preparation is less intrusive and expensive. So green uh, burial concerns, uh, uh, first of all, and yes, it's legal. Uh, remember I said it was legal in, in Michigan. Uh, this research is, uh, was provided by Lee Webster, a consultant member of the Conservation Burial Alliance. Um, difficult to find green burial? Yeah, definitely. Not many certified green burial preserves, especially close by. Um, there is potentially a new uh, startup in, in I apologize, folks. I well, I was fully in problem. Um, <clears throat> um, so the, I wanted to shout out. For, it's called West Michigan Burial Forest Preserve, and that's in Grand Rapids. So uh, they have a website, and uh, they encourage people to help them out because they've got to raise a lot of money. Uh, but they also uh, uh, would would argue that uh, they would love to see you walk the, the property if you're if you're so inclined. Um, no embalming is permitted. Uh, times issues are a concern. Uh, in Michigan, you have 48 hours uh, before you have to embalm. But if you're transporting your, the body to, uh, let's say, Foxfield in Ohio, as long as you uh, put it in a sound, put the body in a sound shipping case and you get a certification from a funeral director that you have the permission to transmit this body across state line, Ohio is fine with it because they don't have any embalming laws either. Oh, I'm so uh, uh, We talked about grave markers, that's not, not, a, that's not a problem. Um, state laws, uh, we, we talked about that too. Um, Michigan, we said did. Uh, most states do not. Um, it's not the typical, as we pointed out, it's not the typical kind of church wedding. It's a walk through a nature preserve. Uh, number six, slow decomposition. Six weeks to lose, to lose the soft tissue and up to two years for a complete decomposition. decomposition. Um, seven. Barrels occur 3.5 3 under the ground with a minimum of at least 18 inch smell bear. Animals are much more interested in live prey. Um, burials uh, 3 feet, 3.5 deep, there's no danger of contaminating potable water. Um, that's usually found at 75 feet below the surface. And um, number nine, uh, soil is the best uh, natural filter. Microorganisms break down any chemical compounds, making them un able to travel. Okay, gosh. I, 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 I want to take time with this. This is, this, is, this is a Kenyan college student. Remember we talked about the difference between the younger generation and the older generation in terms of their attitude? All right, okay. So that's uh, where I'm the board member, Legacy Land Conservancy in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, that's my email address if you have a question that I haven't been able to take time to answer because I wait, took way too much time. But... Yeah, yeah, okay. So, I mean, we can take a few, uh, uh, right? Yeah. It has a sign-up sheet for the Legacy Land Conservancy, and I'll have them up front. So we're in the process of trying to move forward. Yeah, 
Uh, thank you very much for a very thorough examination of this, but I've only got a couple of minutes left. Let me make a comment or some additional information. The closest green burial site for us is, of course, Riverview Memorial Garden to Granville, which is just off of M6 at the first exit. For $3,200, you can get a plot. It'll, it'll open, they'll close, it'll do everything for you. In addition, for $100, you can reserve a plot there for five years. The $100 is not refundable at the end of five years, and the cost of being there whenever you decide to do that would be the cost at that particular time. So for $100, if you have any doubts about this, you could reserve something for five years. Um, the other question, or the other thing I wanna mention is that in investigating uh, Green Barrel with Riverview Memorial Gardens and local field directors, yes, you could save money, but it's not significant difference uh, in savings. So it's just something else that uh, you might think about. The biggest disadvantage in my view of a green barrel, and I'm still considering it, is the lack of time to bury the body. Most funeral homes will say you've got 70 to, 48 to 72 hours, but I understand some, or some, some will do it even longer. Depends on how long they'll refrigerate the body. So that's all I really had to add from a local standpoint. I, I just to make two comments. Number, number one, I was talking about conservation burial cemeteries. So there are none in Michigan. And I did mention the, the, the natural and also the hybrid. And secondly, you know, if you go back to a previous slide also, cost is only one of the considerations. The other consideration is impact on the environment. So I, I and, and I think it, the, the, the increase in interest in green burial is primarily being driven by that. People do not want the last act here on this planet to harm it. That's a simple way of explaining it. Yes, ma'am. Oh. I wasn't sure from the presentation whether if you have a conservation burial plot, if you can have some kind of marker. Yeah, you can, you can, you can, you can I mean, it's a, it's a flat headstone. Remember mm -hmm. that one picture where it yeah. showed the GPS? Yeah. 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 Or um, you don't even have to have a headstone if you don't want to. You can, um, typically these conservation burial cemeteries allow you to plant native plants or trees. So they have an inventory of things that you can also plant at the grave site. That can be a, an indication, you know, in 30 years, if you have this huge burr oak tree that's growing up. Mm -hmm. Okay. That, that Thank was, you. That was grandpa's grave. Well, sorry, we've run out of time, but 